with that, our next speaker is Tavish Armstrong. Uh, Tavish is a software engineering student at Concordia University. Last year, he edited the Performance of Open Source Applications, a collection of essays about optimization written by the maintainers of various open source projects. It is part of a phenomenal AOSA series uh, that if you buy it, all of the proceeds go to Amnesty International, so I, I super recommend it. Um, so please give a warm welcome to Tavish, who will be talking about software engineering research for hackers, bridging the two solitudes. Thanks. Is this on? OK. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, I wanted to start out by uh, thanking Dana Bauer, who uh, encouraged me to submit a talk proposal to PyCon. I, uh, yeah. Um, so you have her to blame if this goes badly, and you have her to thank if it goes well. So I'm going to ruin my talk for you um, in the first slide. I'm going to talk about uh, what this talk is about. It's about uh, using data analysis to uh, analyze the open source projects that we work on to learn more about how the development process works and um, learn more about how we work. I think this can help us make smarter decisions about how we program and uh, encourage us to have better, more productive conversations about this. So fundamentally, this talk is about conversations. It's about what we tell each other is true about programming and how we decide you know, on this knowledge, what we know, and how we know it. I was reading a book on Haskell recently, and uh, this line jumped out at me. It surprised me. It, it read, uh, an important aspect of Haskell's power lies in the compactness of the code we write. Compared to working in popular traditional languages, when we develop at Haskell, we often write much less code, and substantially less time, and with fewer bugs. This is an interesting statement because, uh, as far as I could tell, the author is um, basing this completely on intuition, on their experience, which is great. We should talk about um, the experience that we have writing software and compare that to other people's experiences. And this is a totally valid thing to do. But it's of limited use. Not everybody agreed. Somebody in the comment section actually um, challenged this person. They said, my impression is that the Haskell shrinking factor averages around four, but obviously it varies a lot. This is a surprising amount of precision for somebody who's also making this number up. <laughs> and that's OK. I mean, we're talking about our experiences writing software. And it's, um, this is how this person feels. But wouldn't it be so much better if we knew whether or not this was true? If we knew this was true, we would know something more about how software works. If we knew that it took less time to write Haskell code, maybe we would switch to Haskell. I don't know. So this isn't about somebody being wrong on the internet. This is about somebody who could be more right on the internet. We say a lot of things to each other that um, you know, if they were true, if we actually have ev evidence for them, I think we would act differently. Uh, you've probably heard somebody say, you know, Python is more readable than other languages. Um, you know, put up your hand if you think this is true. Cool. Um, I actually think this is true, but it, it, we could do usability testing on languages and find out which ones are actually more readable. Do that for different uh, kinds of programmers, novices or experts or whatever. And if we know this, then you know the next series of languages that we're inventing will know how to do that better. Uh, you know, we can talk about unit testing, whether or not it's useful. Um, Python is it good for beginners. Uh, that's an interesting question. If Python is actually better for beginners, we should teach Python to beginners, right? Um, this notion that happy programmers make better programmers. Um, like these are all, if we knew that these were true, we would act differently, I think. Uh, when talking about code review, we can say a lot of things like this. Like A lot of people recommend that you keep your patches slow. Um, some people think that code review is just nitpicking. Why don't we look at code review in the wild and see whether or not these things are true? See how big patches usually are. So fundamentally, we're talking about facts that have no foundation. Uh, they're based on intuition and based on rationalizing what we feel. And there is value in that. 
People who do science really get this, right? When they make claims, they need evidence to make those claims. And if there are claims that they're just kind of taking for granted when they're doing their research, maybe somebody else has already convinced them that something is true, then they have citations to that. They tell you where you can also be convinced that these things are true. That works pretty well. Can we do that in our communities? Can we do that for software engineering? We do benchmarks to test performance. We usability test our UIs, and we use analytics on our websites. So why don't we turn these, um, this kind of inquiry on ourselves? I think we'd be happier and better programmers if we did this. The person who got me interested in this topic was uh, Greg Wilson. He gave a great talk at a student conference in 2010 called What We Actually Know About Software Development and Why We Believe It. <laughs> Thanks. Um, we talked about, uh, he, he talked about um, sort of cutting edge software engineering research, um, sort of what academics who research software developers know about how software development works. He put together a book called Making Software, where every chapter is uh, written by researchers who uh, either do this analysis or are uh, doing a survey of existing analyses. It covers topics like offices. You know, should you keep, um, sh should you have private offices for developers? Should you have open plan develop, uh, open plan offices? In what kind of situations are these um, useful? Uh, is per per programming useful? Maybe the more, more useful question is, in what situations is it useful? Um, is it cost effective to have two developers working on the same thing? Uh, they talk about modern code review and how it actually works. And um, a really interesting chapter is on failure prediction using organiza organizational structure of the developers working on the code. So what that showed was that um, the, uh, the number of bugs that would be uh, caused by a file had more to do with the communication structure of the people working on the on that code than things like test coverage or um, uh, complexity metrics or any of these things that we talk about so often. It was how the develop like the social structure that sat on top of the technical structure that was more important. Greg also edited a blog called the uh, It Will Never Work in Theory blog, where they summarize uh, research as it comes out in you know, in words that aren't completely alienating to people who actually write code. It's a, it's a great blog and you should check it out. I'm gonna go over some interesting papers that I think are, are kinda cool and teach us things we didn't know about software, or maybe we thought we knew but we actually had no proof for. So here's an example, what can we learn about code review? I just mentioned that um, people like to say things about code review and um, they might not actually have any evidence for it. Uh, so Peter Rigby, who was my supervisor last summer, and Christian Bird, who is with uh, Microsoft Research, uh, published a paper called Convergent Contemporary Software Peer Review pra Practices. And they did very basic statistics on uh, a couple large open source projects and some closed source projects, including Bing and uh, SQL Server, and sort of com comparing the way that code review works on these projects. As you might think that open source projects work differently than, say, Bing or, or something like that. Uh, this is a set of uh, violin plots looking at patch sizes on these projects. So the size of the patch that gets submitted to a code review system, um, they're pretty similar across all these projects. They vary between 45 and 150. Uh, so certainly if you're working on one of these projects, you want to keep your patches small. And it's interesting that um, all these projects are converging on this practice. It, it might mean that it's a good thing, might not, but it, it, it's certainly something that we didn't know before. Um, this is similar and it looks at um, how long it takes for the first reviewer to take a look at the patch and review it. And they're pretty similar across the board. Uh, this is the number of review reviewers that each patch gets. So the notion that many eyeballs make all bugs shallow, I don't know if that's true, but it seems like two eyeball, or sorry, four eyeballs seem to work in most cases. Or at least, if you add more eyeballs, they stop really being effective. Uh, some researchers from Waterloo, uh, Hindle and friends, in 2006, they did uh, what I think is really cool here. They, they took sort of 
contribution data on some open source projects, including MySQL, and they did a Fourier transform of these events. And if you do that and you plot a spectrogram of it, you can sort of see, you can detect periodicity in the data. You can um, tease out some structure out of what you think is a disorganized open source project. So with open source, it's often that there is structure, it's just hidden instead of explicit as it would be in closed source. Okay, academia is hard, writing papers or reading papers isn't fun. Uh, let's write some code instead. So in September, I, on a Friday night, at 1 a.m., I think, I made this uh, IPython notebook using a tool I, I, I built called git to json to pull out uh, co uh, commit data from, uh, from the IPython project. I used pandas to analyze this data, and I had one question, which was, you know, how long does it usually take to review a patch on IPython? You know, the result is this plot. Um, you can see that they're usually pretty fast. Um, and this was like really simple. It took me an hour, um, and you know it was a lot of fun. We don't really know that much about how IPython pull requests work now. To be clear, this is not mind-blowing research. But we know something we didn't before. And I put this on the internet, and Greg Wilson very generously called this the future of software engineering. I'm flattered. Um, Fernando Perez posted it as well, and you can see that you know it's not you know, in the thousands of retweets, but, you know, people, people read it and they acknowledged that it existed, uh, which I thought was pretty cool because I just kind of did this on a Friday night. I was looking at this with a friend and uh, telling him about this weird math that I thought I had done wrong. And we looked at the code and, you know, he pointed out the problem and I fixed it. And so now this, like, pseudo paper that I have online, it has, it, it's been, it, it's had a bug fix of her, uh, applied to it. Somebody forked my repository and then ran it on their own project. And I know that they ran it on their own project because I got this bug report. <laughs> the tool that I wrote to parse uh, git logs was choking on this person's project, which was SymPy, the, the symbolic um, math library for Python. And it, and it was breaking because somebody who contributes to SymPy has an accent in their name. So I fixed that bug. And then uh, I was interviewing for a job recently, and um, they asked for a, a sample notebook showing like how I do data analysis. I sent them this, and they said, "Oh, this is pretty cool. Um, why don't you try doing the analysis like this?" They used a module called Lifelines to plot um, the Kaplan-Meier curve, which sort of uh, is a much better way of looking at how long it takes for these things to get merged. So this little experiment I did, people read it. They reproduced it, they fixed it, and they improved on it. That sounds a lot like science. So that was fun. A couple months later, uh, the International Conference on Software Engineering, a few people published a paper on something very similar. They looked at pull requests over hundreds of uh, Ruby projects on GitHub. And they found out similar things. They, they could find um, that 80% you know, of pull requests were merged within three days, 30% were merged within an hour, and 70% of all pull requests uh, were merged. You know, this is for that subset of Ruby projects that they, that they were working on. And this is neat. And they also built a decision tree based on um, sort of what factors actually affect what patches get merged. They found that the most significant factor was how active the area affected by the patch uh, has been recently. So if you are trying to get a patch into a system that is being modified a lot by other people right now, you're going to have a hard time. Uh, the size of the project was an important factor. And the number of files changed by the pull request was also important. So if you're making a pull request, you should probably try to modify as few files as possible. And this is something that people uh, uh, say a lot. Like This is useful advice that we already know if we write software. But now we actually know it. So here's another interesting question. Um, a lot of us use Git, and you know, how do people, how do individuals use Git differently? My friend Julia built this tool that you can, um, you you type a one-liner bash thing into your terminal, and up, uh, upload the results to her server, and it will generate you a, a directed graph like this. It shows what commands you use, how frequently, and um, 
what command you most are most likely to use after you do that command. So uh, after I commit, I am most likely to push. That's why that arrow is so fat. We can look at Julia's graph. We can talk about why it looks different than mine. If, um, if my friend Greg really doesn't like Git, I can look at his graph, look at my graph, and see what's different about his. And maybe I can suggest something that he should look into. And maybe this will make him a happier Git user. Who knows? He might be a lost cause. At Mozilla, they're taking this very seriously. They're um, trying to collect contributor data from all over the organization. Uh, and they want to answer questions like, um, why do people leave Mozilla? Why do they lose contributors? If we know why people are leaving the project, we can keep people happier, I think. This is something that we should strive for, I think. So here's an interesting project idea. I think people have looked into this before, but um, it could be fun to get started. This commit has been pretty famous recently. This is the commit that added the Heartbleed bug to OpenSSL. Um, I don't know if you can read the date in the back, but it's December 31st. And I'm not sure where this person is, but it looks like it was pretty late in the evening on New Year's Eve. Can we look at the projects that we work on? Look at, um, look at all the bugs, see when they were committed, and can we learn something about you know, when bugs are most likely to be committed. If we know something about this, we can maybe stop committing stuff after 4 p.m. when we're tired. Um, there's a really interesting talk by Michael Feathers on this, uh, on this topic. He's done a lot of cool talks like this. And um, uh, you, you can do things like pull um, sort of architectural elements out of software just by looking at what files are committed together. And I think he's looked at this issue as well. So we have all this data, and we're doing science on it. We've learned things about software development. And I think we can also build tools using this data. Uh, I, I built this module called git to json which helps us analyze the data. But if you have that tool, then you can um, build something like git coach, which uh, Mike Hoy at Mozilla built. It looks at what files you commit together. And before you commit, you say git coach, and it tells you, oh, you've modified uh, the setup.py file. Maybe you also want to modify your history file because it looks like you're about to make a release. Um, we could build something like prlint. So when you make a pull request to a project, it looks at how big it is, it looks at um, how many files you touch, how poorly written the description is, uh, something like that. And we can give scientifically valid suggestions on how to make better patches. This would save reviewers time, and it would save authors time. So what I want you to do is I want you to go out there, study the software that you write. Teach your friends something cool that you learned about how software development works. Back it up with evidence. Share what you learned with others. Upload IPython notebooks. Uh, tell people that you're doing this. Build on the work that other people are doing. Build tools to make this easier. What I would really like is if in PyCon uh, 2015, which is going to be here next year, I want somebody in this audience to give a talk on what they learn from software. I want you to go out, do this, and give a talk on this next year, and I'll come. And I'd be really excited about that. So thanks. Thank you so much. I'm super fired up by this. Uh, we have uh, time for questions. There's only one mic, and it's over here. So if we could please queue up over here. Hi. Um, I have uh, maybe not a question as much as a statement, but the PR Lint uh, idea is a really good one. Uh, and I have a project that I've been working on call called Imhotep uh, that, will, that does PR Lint. Um, and it does it more on a source code basis rather than uh, sort of run things like PEP8 and uh, those kind of static analysis tools against your pull request and make comments as appropriate. Um, and I would love to talk and or maybe attend some sort of open space on this topic. 
I'm totally down. Um, I'm going to put some notes on at this URL. And if you send me emails about cool stuff that you're working on, I will post it to my blog. I will tweet about it. Um, and yeah, if, if you think this stuff is cool, uh, we should be friends, because I don't think there are that many of us. <laughs> so. Hi, thanks for an interesting talk. Uh, I've been reading Code Complete over the course of a couple of years, and it's uh, really interesting to see just how many studies there are about software practices when so often what we hear is just uh, conjecture. Um, but I'm just wondering, you know, I think there's a kind of thing where it's a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy some of the time. And uh, the, you know, the culture determines how people go about things. So we tell each other, you know, shorter pull requests are better. Uh, therefore, there are more smaller pull requests. Therefore, if you study that, you will find that there are more smaller pull requests. So it's not kind of an organic thing where that's come from. And especially uh, with Python, for example, the, the design of the language uh, favors certain things um, that make it you know, harder to go about things in a different way. So you're going to see you know, more of the thing that the language favors, if that makes sense. So I'm just curious about how you think that interacts with like, uh, studying these kinds of things. So one thing that's interesting about this is you know, if we start studying it and changing the way that we write software, we're kind of changing the thing that we're studying as we study it, and that's um, usually not a good thing. For uh, the, the issue about um, like why we merge pull requests and why we don't, uh, this is a good question, right? Like we we probably merge short pull requests because we keep telling each other that we short uh, we merge short pull requests, not necessarily because they're actually easier to review. Um, I don't know. I think that's all I have to say. I don't know if I have a question. I, I find this stuff really fascinating, and just as an anecdote, so I'm one of the contributors to Twisted. And Twisted has, for, for a long time, we've really struggled with um, having enough review bandwidth to get through all of the um, contributions that people are making. And this is sort of an informal observation, but a way that we try to incentivize people to, you know, having informally observed this, we try to incentivize people to do reviews by creating this um, little 8-bit high scores list. And you would get points for various kinds of contributions, in particular reviews. And it's surprising how um, motivated, you know, at least I become, to if I have an opportunity to get to the top of a leaderboard. Uh, so this was actually really effective for the Twisted community, if you think it might work for your, your community as well. And, and this also reminds me of, I think, in the, the C Python uh, you know, core developers are also, I mean, actually right now there's a thread on Python dev about um, struggling with not having enough review bandwidth. And I bet that if we had data on where in the sort of bug life cycle things stalled, and if we actually could look at how bad the numbers are, that would really kick us in the butt about addressing um, those weakest links. So I think a project that I want to pursue, and I will, you know, I'll do a poster on it next year so you can come and look at it, is I'm pulling out some of this data for Core Python and um, given the number is trying to make those numbers better. So thank you. Cool. Hello. Uh, I think these are really important questions that you're exploring. Um, I've also been doing a report on a kind of new emerging open source project to try to understand, you know, how the dynamics of the community are working, you know, both looking at GitHub data as well as looking at, uh, you know, mailing list data. Um, and I was talking with a friend um, who's doing his master's thesis at UC Berkeley and telling him about these, these questions that I wanted to answer. And he said, oh, I'm, I'm working on it. I'm building a tool right now that can, you know, parse through a mailing list archive and figure out all kinds of, you know, things about how people make decisions and who the influencers are in that community. And, and I said, oh, where, you know, where's the code? He's like, oh, it's not ready yet. And you know, it, it occurred to me that there's probably a lot of really, really, really amazing research that's being done in academia, and that research is not really getting out to the community. And I mean, you sort of touched on this in your talk, but I'm curious if you have any thoughts about how that could be um, shared with the wider open source community so that we as practitioners can actually use that data to become better at what we do. This is an interesting topic, for sure. Um, 
I, I did research in a lab last summer and I, I you know, the sort of code that um, gets written in that environment is, um, I'll put it generously, but like it's, it's not, uh, I think, very stable, it's not maintained, um, nobody's checking to see if it actually works. Um, but I think like in this community, we, we kind of value those things more. And I think the more tools that we build um, that do this stuff right, the more sort of amateur analysis that we do, I'd be curious to see if we can kind of, um, you know, trick people in academia into using our tools and kind of doing this stuff better by um, kind of leading by example, showing them how we want it to be done and then um, have them actually do the hard work. Um, if that makes sense. <laughs> Maybe some IPython notebooks with best practices for how to, how to do this analysis. Yeah. Um, cool, thanks. Thanks. Hi, um, yeah, I like science, I like programming, and I like the intersection of those. Um, and I agree that your call to action is great, like asking all of us to sort of apply scientific thinking to the topics that we're excited about and learn new things from them. Given how little research there is, um, sort of making more of that uh, seems really important. But at the same time, like, there are some findings within academia that answer at least a few of our questions or at least give hints at the right direction, but those findings don't seem to get disseminated. And so we have myths about programming that have been debunked for decades, but still get, you know, show up habitually in like hacker news threads. So it's like, it's like we need a programming snopes.com uh, for like debunking things that are just like known to be false or like known to have no evidence uh, for them. And so it's like, I'm kind of wondering, like, how can that ev evangelism happen? How, like, what resource could we use to make awareness of the few results we do have uh, more prevalent? So I, I touched on this earlier with um, some of the work that Greg's been doing. Um, you know, the, it will never work in theory blog, uh, making software. Um, I think Encouraging programmers who are curious to read papers is great. It doesn't always work. Um, the sort of implicit approach I'm taking is that I think um, that stuff is a lot easier to engage with, and you, you probably understand it better if you try to do some of it yourself. Like the best way to understand a study is to try to reproduce it. Uh, so I kind of want to get people in this community doing some of this themselves. Um, so that you know, they start asking these questions and, and, and then they can go and look up a paper that's already answered their question, because uh, we're lazy. So you know, like we, we like it when other people have answered our questions for us already. There's also a really good book called um, Facts and Fallacies of Software Engineering by Robert Glass, which sort of is a bit like Snopes.com. It's, like, it's a bit old, but um, it does go over like sort of commonly um, repeated myths. Um, did I answer your question? I'm not sure. Okay, cool. So it was, it was fascinating, the kind of data you collected. What you've looked at is basically metadata about changes in software. You've looked at you know, what the numbers of files pulled and committed and maybe the number of lines. Have you considered, or do you know anybody who has, looked at sort of the actual data? There's a commit, it has you know, a particular diff, but that diff is about certain sorts of code constructs and it either you know, gets reviewed quickly or doesn't, or it gets approved or it doesn't get approved or it gets reverted or it doesn't based on, you know, something about the structure of the code itself that goes into the commit. I don't think I understand the question, I'm sorry. Um, you know, like, oh, I didn't try anything of an example, but, um, you know, is a um, revision to a method within a class more likely, more or less likely to be accepted than a revision to a function by itself? Or, you know, a rename of a variable, is that more or less likely to be accepted than a uh, change of a math formula or something? These are, these are interesting questions. So I, I don't have like a good answer to like the specific thing that you're saying. Uh, but one thing that um, some people have looked at is, um, like some people have been doing code complexity measures and stuff like that. Like if you probably heard of McCabe complexity. And, and stuff like that for measuring like how complex a, a piece of software is. 
And some people have looked at, instead of looking at um, you know, the code as a static piece of uh, static object, it sort of appreciates that um, software is in motion. So looking at um, what they call churn metrics, like how much a file has been changed, like how much activity it gets. And these tend to be, um, like they tend to predict um, bugs more. Uh, so like this tells us that um, software being, mod like modification is more dangerous than um, like writing code in the first place. Um, that is, that is all the time we have for questions. We can maybe do some open spaces later. The closing ceremonies are in 10 minutes in the keynote space. Thank you again, Tavish. <laughs>